Uh, thanks to uh, Eric, Jeff, and Terry, of course, for inviting me here. And um, I'm going to talk to you about today uh, something that we're not doing just in Greece, but is an initiative that spans uh, hopefully around the, the globe, and it aims to bring together developing and developed countries. Uh, I'll start with an historical perspective. Um, Hippocrates, uh, several centuries ago, said that it is more important to know what kind of person suffers from a disease than to know uh, the disease that the person suffers. So it's a kind of um, uh, an introduction of the, of the notion of, uh, of personalized medicine. Uh, the Genomic Medicine Alliance is a relatively new initiative that aims to build or strengthen existing collaboration ties between academics, um, researchers, people from the regulatory agencies, and the general public that are interested in all aspects of genomic medicine. And in particular, how you translate research from uh, the, the results from research into, into something clinically meaningful. Uh, the, the Alliance is an international scientific research network. It has nothing to do with the, uh, with the traditional notion of a scientific society. Uh, for example, you can see here that uh, the registration is free of charge, so there are no registration fees, and this is to encourage participation of researchers from developing and uh, low-income countries. Uh, the research activities are self-financed by participants' own funding sources and partly funded by the Golden Helix Foundation, which is a London-based UK charity. Uh, of course, we hope in the future to be able to, to create networks that we could apply for uh, funding from other sources as well. Uh, the scientific coordination of the Alliance is provided by the Scientific Advisory Committee, which is formed by 13 internationally renowned scientists in the field of genomics research. And the administrative assistance, which is, of course, uh, uh, a pain uh, for us uh, researchers, is provided by the Golden Helix Foundation staff. So they do the dirty job for us. Um, so what are the two key elements of the, of the alliance? And uh, in, the, in the mails that we received a few months ago by, uh, by Jeff and uh, Eric, uh, they split the, the notion between genomics research and genomic medicine. So I'm Greek. Ancient Greeks like to create temples. <laughs> So if we, if we depict, uh, if we depict uh, these notions as a temple, genomics research as the basis, uh, the genomic medicine is, is the roof of the temple, and uh, to have them in between, you need to have uh, some pillars. So the pillars that lead from genomics research to genomic medicine is pharmacogenomics, genetics, ethics in genetics, public health genomics, um, uh, increasing the genetic awareness of the general public and education of the healthcare professions. Actually, those two uh, go together. And last but not least, the economic evaluation in genomic medicine. And in fact, the Genomic Medicine Alliance focus in this particular part to, to creating pillars to strengthen the transition from genomics research into genomic medicine. The second aim is to bridge developed and developing countries. So what a developing country could gain from a developed country, of course, it's, uh, it's tech transfer, knowledge transfer, training opportunities. People from developing countries could go to, to developed countries and get trained in centers of excellence. But also developed countries can, can benefit from developing countries by providing cases with very um, uh, unique features that you could study on a genomic basis. Uh, well-defined populations, for example, the gypsies, in, uh, in Europe, which is very well-defined population group, and of course partnership to grant applications, because some grant application has a term that you should have developing countries as partners. Uh, and of course I'm very pleased to be part of this initiative because in all of these places that I've spent my uh, scientific career, uh, we, for example, Patras, we had the, the, the uh, largest uh, cable bridge in the world, Rotterdam, a Cagliari in Italy, they all have bridges, so I feel some kind of like a destiny to be part of this, uh, of this effort. Uh, as I said, the scientific board runs and supervises the, uh, the aims of the alliance, and we have six working groups, uh, genome informatics, pharmacogenomics, cancer genomics, public health genomics, genetics, and economic evaluation in genomic medicine. And as you can see here, the scientific board is it's, it's, uh, it's really international, coming from the Middle East, uh, the UK, uh, developing countries like Slovenia, uh, the US, uh, and so on, even Japan, as you can see here, Mike Lee. Uh, the membership basis has a kind of, of a pyramid structure, so you have the scientific advisory committee that uh, it's on the top that supervises the scientific uh, projects. You have the senior national representatives and the working group leaders that they are in the middle, and then you have the regular members. And if you look in numbers, then you see that the total, number, uh, the total membership is almost 180 people from 53 countries. That's actually uh, updated uh, since last month, 
But the Genomic Medicine Alliance is a relatively new initiative. So we hope that in the future this, uh, the membership basis will be further expanded. I can, uh, I can show now some projects that we are undertaking. Uh, the, first pillar, the, the first pillar, which is pharmacogenomics, the determination of the incidence of pharmacogenomic biomarkers in some European populations. Um, we wish to provide the proof of principle for the use of whole genome sequencing uh, for pharmacogenomic testing and to establish a detailed correlation among genomic biomarkers and adverse drug reactions in European and Southeast Asian population. That's a project that's run by Mike Lee in Riken Institute in Japan. So the EuroPGX project, which is part basically of the, of the PGNI, the Pharmacogenomics for Every Nation initiative, um, aims to collect uh, on average 50 people uh, as the first year and 500 people the second year uh, from developing countries uh, uh, to carry on genotyping in almost 2,000 pharmacogenomically relevant uh, variants in 230 uh, ADMET-related pharmacogenes. That's basically the DMET plus chip by AFI. Uh, and based on these results, uh, to assist in prioritized medication selection in developing countries, that's again in collaboration with the PGN initiative, and to develop off-the-shelf solutions for pharmacogenomic testing in developing countries, for those countries that cannot afford to be tested by whole genome sequencing, of course. Uh, and this is the, the overview of the, of the participating countries in Europe. Uh, th this, uh, this plan is bigger, if you see it worldwide. Uh, those are the PGNI sites, um, the, which is controlled by uh, the, um, the Golden Helix Institute here in Athens. And these are the sites where we hold some educational activities that we're going to mention to you in the, in the next slides. And these are some preliminary data. You see, for example, some unexpected correlation between countries uh, that you would normally expect to be uh, you know, close together, like Serbia, Croatia. They're not lining up together. Uh, and as you can see, of course, here, that's something you expect, that all European countries, they cluster together with the Caucasians. But of course, we should all keep in mind that we may, all, all these countries may be Caucasians, they have significant differences. And this can be over 130 pharmacogenomic biomarkers in each population. And by replicating these findings to a larger population sample, we, could, we hope to be able to establish common ground to provide pharmacogenomic testing in these countries. The second project involves the application of next-gen sequencing in uh, the area of pharmacogenomics. Uh, this exercise involved a, a bit less than 500 genomes that were uh, sequenced in uh, complete genomics and uh, in, a, in, a, in a coverage of 110x, so that's uh, high accuracy. Uh, we analyzed all the variants in the 231 DMET uh, plus genes. We perform in silico analysis to provide, to have a, a, a basic level of functional evidence. Of the, of the causality of these um, variants, and we replicate independent findings in a seven members Greek family. Uh, this, uh, this is gonna, be, it's, it's, it's gonna appear in pharmacogenomics in, uh, in one of the next issues. And these are the preliminary data in uh, the most, most well-studied pharmacogene. So this is CYP2D6, as we all know, it's involved in uh, the metabolism of, of, of more than 200 uh, drugs. This is the total number of variants that you detect by whole genome sequencing. It's on average 18,000 per individual. Um, 16,500 are novel potentially functional variants with a bit less than 1,000 with high frequencies and 4,500 potentially novel in the exome. Now, if one would, uh, would analyze each genome by the DMET plus, he could get just 250 um, SNPs. And DMET plus is the most comprehensive platform existing today. So this is the DMET coverage, as you can see here. Uh, this is the, uh, these, these line are the novel variants. These are the ones, I'm sorry, these are the novel variants. These are the variants that they have frequencies of over 1%, right? So you can see that, that basically with next-gen sequencing, as you would expect, you get the complete picture of a personalized pharmacogenomics profile. The Genome Informatics uh, Working Group, we aim to develop, th we, we, we currently develop three new national ethnic genetic databases uh, to document the incidence of these diseases in these countries. We migrate five existing uh, national genetic databases into the upgraded version of this uh, software. We aim to, de to develop an electronic molecular diagnostic assistant to translate pharmacogenomics results into a meaningful format for clinicians. And this project is uh, partly funded by this, uh, this grant here. And uh, we wish ultimately to establish a whole genome national data repository to uh, provide alert frequency data in, a, in an aggregate level. Uh, we close collaborate with major research initiatives such as RDConnect, uh, like IRDIC, uh, in the areas of harmonizing and develop common standards for database and patient registries for rare disease. 
to develop clinical bioinformatic tools and including data mining and knowledge discovery uh, tools for analysis and integrating molecular and ph phenotypic data and to um, endorse scientific and educational meetings. And this is how the um, find-based database looks like. This is uh, how you document frequencies of causative mutations. This, the, the way that the, you can query among this, uh, th this data is really dynamic. It's a pity I don't have um, a video to show you, but it's really dynamic having all these little boxes here rearranging depending on the, on, on, on the query. Uh, and this is what the Imodia platform would look like. This is just a, a mock-up. You're going to have uh, three different ways of logging in as a medical professional, for research, and as a patient. And to be able to access the data, you could basically need two cards, uh, one from the patient, one from the physician. It's like activating the missiles, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Now, in terms of public health genomics, um, we have undertaken national-wide uh, studies to better understand the level of general public awareness and healthcare professional education uh, over genetics. This, uh, th th this data will, will be published in the first issue of Personalized Medicine this year. We have engaged into a stakeholder analysis to determine the measures that need to be undertaken to expedite genomic basics, uh, uh, excuse me, genomic-based medical decision-making process. That's a paper that is in preparation. For this, we used a software that is used by uh, American politicians to be able to, to project how the general public will feel before and after, right? Um, we encourage and facilitate the coordination, the co-organization of educational events over pharmacogenomics. These are the Golden Helix Pharmacogenomics Days in various European countries. We currently have organized 13 events in eight countries. Uh, including mostly developing countries, but also countries like Amsterdam and the one that's come uh, in 2014 in Cardiff in the UK. Uh, this is the genetics part, the surveying the landscape of the, of the direct-to-consumer and over-the-counter genetic testing in various countries. Uh, and we work together with national genetic societies to try to determine guidelines for um, ethical, legal, and social issues pertaining to genetic testing. That's a recent article we got in Human Genomics about the OTC genetic testing with a, with a very catchy title, as you can see here. And the economic evaluation, last but not least, cost effectiveness, the cost utility analysis to be able to demonstrate that indeed uh, genomic medicine could, could really bring a benefit to the, to, the, to the patient and also to the national healthcare system. We have projects focusing on anticoagulation treatment in several countries from the Balkans. And uh, also there is an endorsement of reproduction of a textbook that's going to be published by Elsevier early 2015. We co-organize educational activities. That's going to be a summer school, uh, with, which will be organized this year in uh, an island, island close to Athens. As you can see, it's, re it's really miserable. You know, very blue waters, very uh, green area, you know. Uh, hopefully you can make it. And uh, also we encourage the development of a special issue about uh, in personalized medicine with the tentative title of Working Towards Personalization of Medicine. That's going to appear in September 2014. Um, now, regarding future plans, we wish to expand the membership basis, particularly with members from developing countries in the Middle East, Asia, Latin America, and Africa, to partner with other multinational groups like the European Alliance for Personalized Medicine to pursue common goals, um, to expand the educational and outreach activities not only in Europe but also in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, uh, and to establish in collaboration with the foundation short and long-term research fellowship for graduate students to do, uh, in fact, part of their work uh, in centers of excellence ab uh, abroad. And last but not least, to affiliate with Elsevier to uh, open access genomic journal as the official journal of the Genomic Medicine Alliance. And hopefully we can reach an agreement with this, uh, to this level, uh, in fact, pretty soon. So I think that's about it. I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Based on time, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. And I'm available to teach in September. Um, <laughs> uh, so yesterday we talked about a number of issues uh, that, um, that, that this field faces in terms of uh, um, informed consent, data sharing, and liquidity. Uh, have you solved these problems across these, the, the, you know, the Pagini and other, uh, the network that you're creating, you know, where you have standardization of some of the informed consents, uh, data sharing agreements in place. I'm just curious as to where you stand with respect to the kind of things that we're uh, struggling with, you know, in, in this community. 
So uh, since we're talking about PGE, uh, we made sure that uh, in in the in the in the sample collection uh, we only document gender uh, and age, and these are basically adults. So we make we make we we try to ensure that uh, every country that participates in this initiative, uh, they have the proper consent. So um, the, the uh, in fact the the, the PGE coordinating center and the regional center uh, receives the samples on the understanding that all the, uh, the proper informed consents are taken. And in, in the majority of the cases, we have also the informed consent uh, uh, sent to us. In local language, of course. So if it is uh, consent in, in, in Czech, I couldn't, of course, make you know, what it means. But uh, at least we know that the consent is there. And so we, re we rely on the partner. Uh, it would be ideal to have a kind of a, of a general consent to be used. Uh, we don't have so far. I'm not sure if Howard wants to comment. Yeah, we, we, have, uh, and we have general principles that need to be in the consent in terms of the, the ability for the, the data to be shared, at least at some level. Uh, yep. we use, we've used regional centers, so the, we, we try to make sure that samples uh, don't go all to one place. So we try, actually, we try to keep the samples from going to the U.S., partly just for uh, political reasons. There's been too much of a, uh, of a colonialist approach by American scientists in the past, and so we're trying to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, at, like the work you're doing in Kazakhstan and some of the other um, aspects. When, the, when it comes down to it, it's the local ethics committee that uh, it rules the day. We have to have approval at, at, uh, in the United States, for example, at U University of North Carolina or now at, at uh, University of South Florida. Uh, but the, uh, the, the one that is really consenting the patient uh, is the, usually a national or regional uh, ethics committee in that individual country. So we, we have principles for them, but we don't write the consent for them, for pg &E anyway. No. Um, so, so it seems like the things that you're doing, a lot of them are the kinds of things that we were talking about doing here, which is great, and you're, you're sort of out of the gate considerably ahead. I, I wonder, you know, in some ways when you're dealing with kind of smaller nations that may be a little more flexible, you can do stuff that may be much more difficult for the developed world to do. I fully so, agree. So, yep. yeah, um, <laughs> so, so we respect that, and, and I'm wondering, you know, if you were to partner then with, with some of the larger, do you feel you might lose some of your flexibility and, and nimbleness um, and some of the, you know, really yeah. the culture that you already have. How would you keep that? To be honest, uh, if I, sp I speak personally, I always feel that one plus one makes three. So uh, it, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't really uh, fear that uh, we lose flexibility. What I really envisage is that we can achieve more. So I see this whole initiative uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to complement other uh, initiatives like the Global Alliance. Uh, I, I, I really feel that this initiative is re it, it, it addresses a niche, which is how to, to bring genomic, uh, the uh, developing countries closer to the genomic medicine by having to gain experience from countries that they have already uh, sorted this out. For example, countries like, uh, speaking from my own country, uh, you know, countries like Greece, uh, um, uh, they, can, uh, they can gain from the experience of the Netherlands or from the US. So how you could, uh, uh, you could manage to get um, the genomic medicine into the mainstream process in anticoagulation, for example, or how you would address uh, an issues regarding, um, in fact, better regulating direct-to-consumer testing. On the other hand, uh, you know, developed countries can also gain from developing countries. So I, we, hear, we heard yesterday in a talk that uh, using European Caucasians. So, what, so, so who can be defined as a European Caucasian? You have British, you have Greeks, you have Russians. They are all Caucasians, but they have different frequencies in terms of markers and in the overall genetic makeup. So I see a, a kind of a bi-directional benefit. And ultimately, the patient gets the best, and genomic medicine goes further. As Francis said also yesterday, yeah? Amazing to me that you think that developed countries have solved these problems <laughs> because um, because I think you know you're hearing from yesterday and, and today that mm -hmm. none of us really have solutions to many of these issues. So um, so I'm not sure we you know that, that the developed countries have a lot to bring other than slowing you down. Um, but it would be it would be wonderful um, to be able to develop some kind of a partnership. Oh, it would be great. Uh, I, in I fully agree with you because I remember last year we were in, in Zagreb in Croatia. And we're sitting at dinner, and somebody said that, uh, well, we actually have our national healthcare system reimbursing pharmacogenomic testing. And I was stunned. Yeah? 
So you hear from these countries, and I'm not sure how the situation is in the U.S., but in Holland, for example, you can get this, um, you can get this reimbursed. So things are, 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 are somehow structured. Um, I, I, I truly believe there, is, uh, there, there, there are common grounds for collaboration between those, uh, I, I, from rich countries and poor countries, developed and developing. Yeah, no, no so yes, we could, we could definitely explore this possibility. Thanks very much.